two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. When adapting any written piece of fiction, decisions must be made with regards to tone, theme, and characterization. Despite the direction the written work steers the characterization towards, whomever is adapting said work will inevitably interpret the characters in their own way and adjust the behaviors, delivery, framing, and direction of the characters accordingly. Today, I want to look at the different interpretations of Romeo and Juliet as portrayed in Franco Zeffirelli's 1968 adaptation of the play and Baz Luhrmann's 1996 film. Both directors brought their own style, themes and tone to their adaptations and this is best seen through their different interpretations of the titular characters. So let's have a look at the infamous lovers through the lenses of these respective directors and see how these interpretations affect the tone and direction of the story. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Romeo Montague is a passionate and impulsive character. He falls in love easily and is presented in the play as more of a lover than a fighter. Both films emphasize Romeo's resistance to the war between the Capulets and the Montagues and choose to show the isolation he experiences because of this with their introductions to the character. Zeffirelli's Romeo is first seen at a distance, walking alone as he is observed from afar by his family the empty space surrounding him literally and metaphorically. The camera pulls in closer so we can study the expression on his face and see how he is oblivious to his surroundings, lost in his own world of quiet dreams. Lerman's Romeo first appears in mid-shot, with the camera panning his body as the light obscures his face, giving us what should be an intimate look at the character, but using the light to hide him as if to portray the hidden depths we've yet to discover. We cut to an extreme wide shot, showing the immense space that literally and figuratively surrounds him, once again emphasizing his isolation from his family, who observe him from a parked car. Romeo's isolation continues throughout both films, even when surrounded by friends. Both movies portray his initial unease at breaching the Capulet's party, especially compared to his more raucous friends, particularly the exuberant Mercutio, and both films leave in Romeo's trepidation at coming events. I fear too early, for my mind misgives some consequence yet hanging in the stars. Shall bitterly begin his fearful date with this night's revels. Watch any Baz Luhrmann film, and a common thread that will emerge is the extreme emotions of his characters. His worlds are often over the top and highly dramatized, and his Romeo embodies this melodrama, being a hot-blooded youth whose passion is constantly threatening to overtake him. From his first scene with his cousin Benvolio, his words spill out energetically, as if his thoughts are racing ahead of his vocalization. Even at this early stage in the film, before any of the impeding tragedy befalls him, his gestures are large and desperate, emphasizing the depth of his emotion. By contrast, Zeffirelli's Romeo is much calmer, more contained, and more idealistic. He moves slowly, with an air of uncertainty to his steps and a dreamlike quality to his words. He has to be coaxed by Benvolio to open up, and his words fall with a softer passion than Lerman's boisterous youth. A beautifully poignant moment shows the horror and despair he feels at the war which surrounds him and his reluctance to be drawn into it. God me, what fray was he? Yeah, tell me not. For I have heard it all. As both films progress, we see the differences between the two Romeos expand. Lerman's Romeo enters the Capulet's party high on drugs and is instantly overwhelmed by the brightness and noise, allowing himself to be drawn into the festivities. Once he encounters Juliet, there is no hesitation on his part, and he pursues her through the party, even as she is led away from him. He speaks to her with fervor and fire in his voice, and their first kiss is deep and without inhibition. Dang. What? <gasps> this Romeo is passionate and hot-blooded and knows who he wants, and he wastes no time in endearing himself to Juliet, winning her over with his romantic words. Zeffirelli's Romeo is much more hesitant 
entering the party behind his louder friends and remaining in the background until he sees and is instantly enamored with Juliet. Even after engaging in a dance with her, his pursuit of Juliet is hesitant, almost timid, as he woos her with his soft words. Their first kiss is gentle, with Romeo's quiet dreaminess putting Juliet under his spell. In contrast to Lerman's Romeo, Zeffirelli's version of the character allows Juliet to lead, asking her permission before succumbing to their desires. Thus, from my lips, by thine, my sin is burned. Zeffirelli's Romeo has a quiet passion and his romancing of Juliet is much subtler and softer than Lerman's Romeo. The point in the films where the two different interpretations of Romeo come out strongest are in the third act of the play, when the war between the Capulets and the Montagues finally overflows and erupts as Tybalt slays Mercutio and is left to face Romeo's wrath. Lerman uses his propensity for melodrama to milk Mercutio's death for every last tear that it's worth. And because his Romeo has been established to be a passionate and hot-headed individual with little reservation when it comes to his emotions, his explosive grief and anger at Mercutio's death feel like a natural extension of this disposition. His initial confrontation with Tybalt sees Romeo subdued and trying to avoid the inevitable fight. He knows to engage with Tybalt is to unleash his own passion and rage, and he senses the danger ahead. We see Tybalt persist in the confrontation, which turns brutal as Tybalt enacts great violence on Romeo, who tries desperately to quell Tybalt's rage. Eventually turning on Mercutio, Tybalt murders Romeo's friend, and Romeo's reaction to this is an intense rage born of his passionate and emotional nature. He gives chase to Tybalt, screaming his anger and grief at his wife's cousin, so overcome with his strong emotions that he seems ready to die to avenge his friend. It is thou, or I, or both must go with him! It is thou, or I, or both must go with him! As he violently grapples with Tybalt and gains the upper hand, his passionate anger engulfs him and he screams in fury, emptying the clip into Tybalt's chest. He is so overcome with emotion that the next scene sees him exhausted and uncharacteristically subdued, so emotionally spent that the news of his banishment barely touches him through the fog of his grief. Having spent so much of the film succumbing to his passion and fire, at the climax of the events, he is rendered speechless, exhausted from the gamut of emotions he has run. Zeffirelli's Romeo enters the same scene in a very different manner. His idealism and optimism prevent him from fully comprehending the danger of the situation he has stumbled into, and he genuinely embraces Tybalt as his kin, naively believing that his marriage to Juliet will heal all wounds. Even as he attempts to stop the duel between Mercutio and Tybalt, his demeanor remains desperately hopeful, as if his love can overcome anything. As the audience, we feel the tension building in the scene, knowing that soon Romeo's idealistic world will come crashing down around him, and as Mercutio collapses in death, we see that moment arrive. Romeo, so hopeful and happy until this point in the film, so filled with love and hope for the future, finally breaks. We see the light leave his eyes and we feel his grief building as he sees what the war has wrought. He gone in triumph and Mercutio slain! Away to heaven! Expensive lenity! Fire and fury be my conduct now! As he chases after Tybalt, it is this grief that is most evident, fueling his words and actions. He engages Tybalt in a sword fight driven by his grief, his motions desperate and passionate, as every strong emotion he's had but always buried comes to the surface. As he slays his wife's cousin, his grief and horror overwhelms him, and in the following scene, we finally see his emotions overcome him, his idealism and romanticism stripped away by the harshness of the war, which has finally succeeded in destroying him. He openly weeps at his fate, unable to comprehend the tragedy which befell him so shortly after his happiest moment. From this scene onwards, the two Romeos truly run in opposite directions. Lerman's Romeo, so passionate and hot-blooded, turns quiet and subdued and succumbs to his Juliet's passion, capturing a brief, happy and passionately alive moment before he is forced to retreat. Zeffirelli's Romeo loses his idealism and gives in to his grief, 
and his morning after with Juliet is much heavier and more desperate. Their sorrow reaching its pinnacle as they are abruptly interrupted, forcing him to flee as Juliet begs him to stay. The two scenes show the different sides to the lovers, one capturing their passion and love and showing the happiness they once had, the other portraying the tragedy and grief which has overtaken them. While the two Romeos share certain similarities across the films, the two interpretations of Juliet Capulet are so vastly different that it can be difficult to believe that they're based on the same character. To complement their respective Romeos, both Juliets are inverses of their lover's personalities. Lerman's Juliet is timid, demure, and often without agency, while Zeffirelli's Juliet is full of life, passion, and autonomy. Unlike Romeo, the differences between the two Juliets are shown from their first appearances. Lerman's Juliet is introduced in close-up, her face submerged underwater, eyes wide, mouth closed. There is a haunting stillness to her as she stares into the audience's soul, as if trying to communicate without words. In this narrative, she is already being silenced, drowning under the metaphorical weight of her surroundings as symbolized through the shot. As the scene moves from her to her much louder nurse and mother, it becomes apparent that she is an afterthought in this house, lost amid the chaos. Juliet is surrounded by noise and color, but not allowed to join the revelry of her own volition, instead being pulled in, often against her will. Her mother talks over the top of her and allows little response, moving abruptly through the room with no patience for her daughter, whose docile demeanor suggests that she is used to such treatment. Madam, I am here. What is your will? By contrast, Zeffirelli's Juliet is first introduced from a distance, but she is vibrant and lively, a lick of flame against the grey of the building. Her colourful clothes and exuberant laughter draws the viewer's eye to her, and she is loud and full of life. The spark of innocence and hope in the dark world of the Capulets, emphasised by her father's gentle affection as he watches her. The hope that she represents for the family will eventually come back to bite her later in the film when she is forced to be their saving grace in the wake of Tybalt's death through her imposed engagement to Count Paris. Lerman's demure ingenue and Zeffirelli's fiery lover are both further explored during the Capulet's party. Lerman's Juliet is instantly smitten with Romeo as she views him through the fish tank, but as is common in her world, she is forced away from him and can only passively watch him from across the room as Paris demands her attention. Her smothered giggles and glances at Romeo suggest a deeper nature wanting to break free, but her surroundings and environment have forced her into submission, and she can only gently chastise Romeo when he approaches, succumbing to his kiss without resistance as she is swept away by his passion. You kiss by the book. Zeffirelli's Juliet is much more forthright in her interactions with Romeo. After dancing with him and being immediately intrigued, Juliet pursues him through the party, even breaking in between people to glimpse him before finally meeting face to face. As Romeo attempts to woo her with his words, Juliet coyly maintains control throughout the interaction, and it is only once Romeo's words manage to hypnotize her that she succumbs to his kiss. This agency continues through to the balcony scene. As Juliet delivers her most famous speech, we feel the longing and desire in her words, her delivery strong and exuberant as she laughs to herself, recalling the passionate moment she shared with Romeo mere hours before. Once Romeo makes himself known, she maintains control of the situation. She is fiery and challenging, and although smitten with Romeo, she demands assurances of love and commitment before she herself will commit. When she proposes marriage, it is with a fervor born of deep love, an unyielding request to gain what she wants. If that thy bent of love be honorable, yes. thy purpose marriage, send me word tomorrow by one that I'll procure to come to thee. Where and what time thou wilt perform the right, and all my fortunes at thy foot I lay, and follow thee, my lord, throughout the world. Lerman's version of the same scene contains a much tamer Juliet. Her words are softer and her demeanor more restrained. She gives in to Romeo's kisses rather than initiating them, and her soft requests for marriage and vows of love come with an air of uncertainty, as if she is testing the waters, perhaps unsure of the depth of Romeo's love. Once again, Lerman's Juliet seems to be pulled into events, moving with an ever-flowing tide rather than asserting her own agency. At the end of the scene, 
Romeo moves to the balcony without invitation and receives Juliet's cross in return, a contrast to the Zeffirelli version where Juliet deliberately calls Romeo back to her and then initiates physical contact. The point at which the two Juliets divert from their usual dispositions is very close to the point at which the two Romeos do, and this is fitting for this play. If Romeo is pointing east, Juliet should be pointing west, two sides of the same coin, always complementing one another to emphasize how they belong together. As Romeo is banished from her life forever and her marriage to Paris is forced upon her, we see both Juliet's emotions head in opposite directions. Lerman's Juliet, so quiet and accepting until this point, finally breaks under the weight of her anguish, and she flies to Friar Lawrence's cell, at last pushed far enough to assert her own power and agency. She confronts the friar with a desperate anger, holding a pistol first to her own head and then to his, her actions strong and defiant. Be not so long to speak, I long to die! She has finally had enough, and she is done with being docile and accepting. Her Romeo is gone, her family is using their last bit of power to rob her of her agency, and she has reached her breaking point. In this version of the story, this is Juliet's shining moment, the turning point at which she takes matters into her own hands and says no to everyone trying to force her into a fate she doesn't want. By contrast, this is the point in Zeffirelli's film where Juliet is finally overwhelmed by the events which surround her and loses her agency. As she begs her father not to marry her off to Paris, she is at her lowest and most desperate, cowering on the floor as her father's rage fills the room, the picture of despair and regret. As she flies into the friar's cell, she is overcome by her grief and can only weep, barely coherent as she pleads for a solution. She has spent so much of the story asserting her agency and blindly defying fate that when it finally catches up with her, she can't do anything but lament the cruelty of it, unable to maintain the passionate optimism of her earlier scenes. Oh, shut the door, and when thou hast done so, come weep with me, past hope, past care, past hell. <laughs> Both adaptations cut Juliet's speech before she drinks from the vial which will put her to sleep, as if to show how desperate and desolate she is. Moved beyond words by her helpless situation, Juliet consumes the potion without hesitation, putting all her faith in the love that will sadly fail to save her. There are many lines of thought when it comes to what Romeo and Juliet is truly about. Is it a cautionary tale about sex-mad teenagers, a warning about the sins of the fathers being passed on to their offspring, or a dark comedy about the stupidity of young love? Every interpretation has its valid points, but no matter what, two aspects will always emerge, the love story between the two leads and the war between the Capulets and the Montagues. This is a tale of star-crossed lovers set against the backdrop of a war which ultimately brings about their doom. The Lerman film and the Zeffirelli film each emphasize one of these different aspects through their interpretations of the characters, and as a result, the Lerman film is more about the war while the Zeffirelli film is more about the romance. Due to this, we end up with a film about one of the lovers versus a film about both. Lerman's decision to overdramatize the war between the feuding families means that Romeo gets pushed to the forefront, and his decision to make Romeo the hot-blooded fiery lover and Juliet the demure and dreamy ingenue reduces Juliet's role within the play, especially because Romeo is the one who has more action within the narrative. He is the one who sneaks into the enemy's house, he is the one who initially goes to Friar Lawrence, and he is the one who ultimately gets pulled into the war and ends up murdering two people. Because of her gender, Juliet does not participate in the war between the houses, and many of her scenes are her reacting to events rather than engaging in them. Because Lerman's Juliet is so passive, her reactions are mostly muted, and, as previously mentioned, she often feels like an afterthought, someone pulled along by the tide but never allowed to learn to swim. Zeffirelli counters Juliet's inaction by making her personality so bright and exuberant that it feels like she is doing much more within the narrative than she actually is. By allowing her to take the lead in the relationship, Zeffirelli grants her more agency within the story. She is the one calling the shots, with Romeo enthusiastically acquiescing to her passionate requests. 
Her reactions to the events of the play are much more intense than in Lerman's film, especially with regards to the murder of Tybalt by Romeo's hand and the news of her arranged marriage to Paris. By allowing Juliet so much agency and emotion, Zeffirelli's film becomes much more focused on the lovers and the tragedy of their circumstances rather than the war which surrounds them. And this difference between his film and Lerman's is probably emphasized best by the infamous suicides of the titular characters. In the original play, Romeo comes across an unconscious Juliet and believes her to be dead, while Juliet awakens to find Romeo dead without explanation. Both lovers are given their own scene in which to process their grief and anguish, deliver their speeches, and then kill themselves with horrific violence, echoing the violence which has surrounded them for the latter half of the play. See what a scourge is laid upon your hates, that heaven finds means to kill your joys with love. Lerman alters these events, and in doing so, diminishes Juliet's death scene. While his Romeo is allowed to scream defiance at the stars, engage in a thrilling chase through the streets of Verona, and take the long walk to Juliet's grave, which ends with him delivering his speech and consuming the poison which ends his life, Juliet is not afforded the same consideration. Instead of having Juliet wake once Romeo has died, Lerman has her wake as Romeo is drinking the poison, and as such, what should be her scene and her scene alone becomes her and Romeo's scene. It is no longer about the tragedy of Juliet waking hopeful and full of love, expecting her husband to be there only to inexplicably find him dead, but rather about the tragedy of Romeo seeing too late that she is still alive. Juliet's scene actually becomes more about Romeo than her, and after he has died in her arms, she is afforded one line of her lengthy speech before passively shooting herself in the head. Her death is filmed from afar, the violence and bloodiness of it lost in the aesthetics of the shot. We aren't allowed the horror at a young woman taking her life, and the emotion of Juliet's final action is, once again, silenced. In contrast to this subdued and shared suicide, Zeffirelli's adaptation gives both lovers their tragic scenes. Romeo is afforded his grief at his lover's death in a beautifully quiet and intense scene, which shows how he has made his choice and is taking his last look at Juliet before joining her in death. Meanwhile, Juliet is given her full death scene, and with Zeffirelli's film, we get the full scope of her grief. After waking, hopeful and optimistic, she discovers Romeo's body, and in one of her final acts of assertion, staunchly remains behind in the crypt while the friar flees. Far from the beautiful and quiet aesthetic of Juliet's final moments in the Lerman film, Zeffirelli's Juliet is loud and angry in her grief, delivering the majority of her speech and wailing over the injustice of her lover's death. When she hears the guards coming for her, her decision to end her life is swift and final. Oh, happy dagger! This is thy sheath. There rust and let me die. There is no shying away from the violence of her death, rather an unflinching shot of her driving the dagger into her own heart, the horror and violence laid bare for the audience to see as she sinks onto Romeo's corpse. At the end of the day, the differences between the two films do not necessarily make either film a better or worse adaptation than the other. Each director adapted this timeless tale to suit not only the decade in which they were made, but also their individual directing styles. As mentioned, Lerman has a propensity for melodrama, and in a modern adaptation of this particular play, said melodrama pairs better with the violence and emotion of the war rather than the passion of the romance. Audiences tend to be harsher on modern romances than they are on romances in period drama. It is easier to believe that two people can fall in love at first sight when they're set against the sometimes fantasy-like backdrop of a period setting. For a 90s MTV era audience, the love story might come across as cheesy or contrived, so Lerman's decision to focus on the war was probably a smart one, and because Romeo is the one who is actually involved in the war, it would only be natural that his story be the one at the forefront. Zeffirelli's adaptation was released in the late 60s when audiences may have been more resistant to a modern take on the tale. And so, his adaptation 
plays into the period drama aspect full hilt, indulging in the sumptuous costumes, sets, and production values which were common in Zeffirelli's films, using them all to enrich the story of the two lovers. Zeffirelli's film uses the war as a backdrop, showing how it insidiously creeps into the lovers' lives until it eventually takes over and ruins them. Because the war is the secondary story in Zeffirelli's adaptation, his movie is equally about the young couple and both get their time to shine in the spotlight. Whichever adaptation one prefers, one thing is abundantly clear. The tale of Romeo and Juliet is rich, timeless, and open to many different interpretations. Using their individual interpretations of the characters, Baz Luhrmann and Franco Zeffirelli each created their own unique take on the tragic tale, gracing audiences everywhere with their rich adaptations, which continue to stand the test of time. A glooming peace this morning with it brings. The sun for sorrow will not show his head. For never was a story of more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo.